Now, the chemical reaction we're looking at today is the old vinegar and baking soda volcano. But this reaction doesn't have anything to do with volcanoes. It's chemistry. Now, this experiment is totally safe, but I do recommend you get an adult's permission before you do it because it's very messy. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> First, you're gonna want baking soda and vinegar. These are your two main ingredients, but you'll also want dish soap and red food coloring if you want it to look a little bit more like lava. Now, I like to mix the baking soda, red food coloring, and dish soap together with a little warm water, so all you have to do is add the vinegar. And when you do, this is what happens. And there you go, chemical reaction. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how much vinegar or baking soda do I use? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. This is where you can be science maximites. Try different amounts. More vinegar, more baking soda, more dish soap. Who knows? Write down the amounts each time you use it and find out what amounts work best. That's called science. So how do you build a balloon-powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon-powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built. But I will give you some tips, though, that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster. And then you stick the balloon on there and it allows you to attach something to the car and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this, you can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Duh. This one I made out of paper plates, and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car, because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, the dragster model. It's a long broom handle, and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars, because I can race them. Sunday, 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 at the Science Maxidrome. It's the balloon power car winner take all drag race of awesome. First up, the Eliminator. <laughs> Woohoo! Better late than never, it's the Procrastinator. <laughs> Crushing the competition, it's the Terminator! <laughs> Feel the chill of the refrigerator! <laughs> And last but not least, the um, regurgitator. <laughs> well, 
when you build your balloon-powered cars, you can figure out what worked or uh, what didn't work and try modifying your designs to make them work even better. That is science. All right, let's build our catapult. The first step, take four pencils and stick your popsicle stick in between so you have two on the top and two on the bottom. And then use your elastic to go around and around and around. That's why I like building things with elastics because it makes it very fast to tie things together because once you go around and you have it nice and tight, you just pop it over the end and voila, it stays together. And that is how you start making your frame. Put more pencils on that side and another popsicle stick on the other end held on at the corners with more elastics. Then take even more elastics and put them right around the middle until you get this. I've added a few more elastics around the middle here, and that is where we're gonna get all of our elastic force. I think I have six. The more you use, the better it's going to work. Take your popsicle stick, stick it in between the elastics, and then start spinning it around. Here's the reason I use pencils and popsicle sticks is because the pencils are a little bit longer, which allows you to twist the popsicle stick around in the middle and build up the elastic force. Now, because I'm twisting, the elastic force we're using here is called torsion, or twisting force. When you feel you have enough torsion, pull your popsicle stick down a little bit so it won't unwind on you, and you'll see that you have all kinds of elastic energy. Then, take your spoon and stick it on the popsicle stick, and you can also break off the popsicle stick if you want to make sure it's the right length, and it works like that. To make the frame, you just need more pencils and elastics. The trick is to make a triangle with two pencils attached to your frame. They should stick up right where your catapult arm would be fully upright. Then take a final pencil and put it across the top. Don't forget to pull the arm back before you put the pencil across, otherwise it'll end up on the wrong side. Now, this is very complicated and I went pretty fast, so if you want the step-by-step -step instructions on exactly how to build this, go to our website. And there you go, a catapult of your very own that you can use to knock down very small castle walls. I've also built a larger catapult using all of the same principles. Pretty good, huh? It's got a longer arm, which means I can throw marshmallows even further, whoa, or, I can throw larger marshmallows, or I can throw very large marshmallows. Hey, Science Maximites, I, I, ah! Ugh, slippery, but that's okay, because today we're talking about friction. Friction is a force that is everywhere and happens when any one thing rubs against any other thing. We do lots of things to increase friction, like uh, like wear shoes with big treads on them. And we can do things to reduce friction, like the experiment we're doing today. We're gonna build a hover disc, and it's very easy. You take some cardboard and cut it into a circle, just like this. Then put a hole in the middle of the circle. You might want an adult to help you with that. And then take a plastic drink bottle cap, like this. I like the ones, use the ones that uh, you get on sport bottles because they have a little nozzle that pops open or closed. And then you glue it around the circle and you get this. Then you need a balloon. So you blow up your balloon. I know you know that step. And then twist the balloon so it doesn't get away from you. When it's nice and twisted, you can stick it over the drink bottle cap like this and then untwist it. And this is why I like to use the plastic drink bottle caps that come from sport bottles because you can open it when you want. And when you do, your disc rides on a cushion of air, reducing the friction with the table, and it's almost like it's sliding on ice. You can also use CDs if you want to do a different design. Just make sure you're using CDs you never want to listen to again. Oh, hi, Science Maximites. Have you ever been eating pasta and wondered, what could I build with this? Could I build something that could hold an impressive amount of weight? Well, I have. And that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. But we're not gonna use cooked pasta because it's too delicious. We're gonna use uncooked pasta, which is less delicious, but it's great for building. 
we're gonna make a pasta bridge. Here's how you do it. First, you wanna start with a plan. And then, you wanna take your pasta, I'm saying pasta, but of course, spaghetti is usually the best thing to use, and lay it out on your plan. The reason you have a plan is so that you can make sure all of the spaghetti is exactly the right length. Lay it out on your plan, perfectly aligned like that, there. And now, it's time to glue it all together. Now, you can use white glue, but it takes a long time. So I suggest a hot glue gun, but make sure you get an adult's permission before you use one of these, okay? So, you take your plan, you lay it out, you glue it up, don't glue it on the paper, because that will be bad, and you will end up with your truss. And it looks just like this. Now remember, you want two sides because those are the sides of your bridge. And as you can see, I've used several strands of pasta because that'll make it a little bit stronger. Once you have your trusses, it's time for the next part of the plan. This is the roadway, and it works the same way. Lay out your pasta, glue it up, and bam, there it is. Now, you put your trusses on your roadway, and you glue them all together, and you also want to put some struts along the top here, probably, to keep it nice and rigid. In the end, you will end up with a fantastic looking pasta bridge. Pretty good, huh? No! Pasta bridge. No other bridge could claim to be 100% pasta. Minus the glue. 99.8% pasta. 0.2% glue. I say there, Captain. Set sail. Let's sail for the land of pasta bridges. Now, if that was pretty fast for you, don't worry, all the instructions are gonna be on our website. Now, a bridge isn't a bridge unless it spans a gap, because that's what bridges are for. So you put your pasta bridge up there, across the books like that, and then you can see just how much weight the bridge holds. It's pretty impressive, if you build it right, even something as flimsy and as delicate as pasta can hold quite a bit of weight. I like to use big, heavy blocks and put them in the middle where there is no support from the books whatsoever and just keep adding heavy things and see how much weight the bridge will hold before it breaks. How much will it hold? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. That's where you get to be science maximites and find out for yourselves. There are two poles to every magnet, uh, just like the Earth. There is a North Pole and a South Pole. That's right, the Earth is a giant magnet. So, if you take kitchen magnets, you'll find that there's two different poles. I've written North and South on these ones. They don't normally come like that. If you put the North and the South together, they stick. But if you put the North and North or South and South together, they repel. They repel, see? They don't want to go together at all. And you can force them together if you want, but if you do, they will spring away the second you let them go. <laughs> but when magnets repel each other, I find that some of the most interesting stuff. Check this out. This is just a small container, and I've got a magnet in here, and I have a loony attached to it so that it fits nicely in the container like that. For the top, I've attached two magnets together, and I have another coin on it. And if you put them in there, I've made sure that the two poles repel each other, which means this magnet will just sit there and float. Magnetic levitation. Very interesting, and you can pop the top on that if you want and just carry around a levitating magnet. Now, there's a couple fancier ways you can levitate stuff with magnets. This is just a wooden frame I've made. Uh, this is completely not necessary. You can use just about anything in your house. A desk lamp works really well. The important part is I've tied a magnet to the end of this arm here, and this is a bolt, which is attracted to the magnet, but it's got a thread tied to it, so it can't get there just far enough that it will actually hang in mid-air. Look at that, it's not attached to anything, it's just being pulled up by the attraction from the magnet. The thing is, as soon as you pull the bolt away far enough, it will lose the attraction and it'll just fall. Very cool. Here's one that's a little bit more complicated, but is also really neat. This one uses disc magnets, which have a circle or a hole in the middle of them here. And you put two around a pencil, and then four more in such a position that you can put the pencil against this wood on the side, and it will just levitate on its own. 
You can even give it a spin. Look at that. So you know that some things float and some things sink, like rocks or wood or uh, full water bottles and empty water bottles or uh, carrots, foam, waffles, screwdriver, playing cards, plasticine, tin foil, potato, my watch. Hmm, wait. That wasn't, that wasn't supposed to go in there. So how, oh. So how do you make a boat? You make it out of something that floats, right? Well, most boats are actually made out of metal. Tin foil is metal and, well, it sinks. But if you fold tin foil into a boat shape, it floats. And boats don't only float themselves, but they can hold people and cargo. In fact, there's container ships crossing the ocean at this very moment that are holding thousands of tons of cargo, and they're all made of metal, which doesn't float, it sinks. So how do boats do it? Are they magic? No, of course not. Boats are science. And here, you can be science maximites. Get some tin foil and cut it into the same size pieces and fold a couple different shapes of boats and see which one can hold the most weight before sinking. <laughs>